can you give a little bit of just sort of general background about yourself, you know, up to, well, from your college years up to now? Sure, yeah. So I started by studying physics, maths and art at, at college. Um, moved on to physics at university. Um, and then post that, I went into computer game design first uh, and multimedia, which was, which was exciting and creative. Um, and then uh, after a couple of years, um, one, of my, um, one of my friends at university, Matthew Bryars, uh, had finished his master's and we decided to set up a company. Uh, and we were looking at hosted software, uh, which was quite an exciting new idea at the time, it was about 13 years ago. Um, and I've been involved in Ariandi ever since. How did you come up with a title? Uh, long story. <laughs> um, so actually it derives from the name of a computer game that I had made with my brother when I was about 14. Um, and that computer game was based in a star system far, far away. Uh, and we were going through various names and um, I remembered uh, Epsilon Ariandi uh, as, an, as the name of the star years and years later. Um, although it turned out that that wasn't the star's name at all, it was Eridani and we misspelt it. So it was, it was a fairly made up name in the end. Um, but it did have the fringe benefit that the main name was free, which was, which was great. So here we are, quite searchable. So you originally studied physics um, and you've kind of leaned towards the IT area. I mean, what, what, what is it that attracts you about the IT area? I think there's a, there's a lot going on in, in IT and software. Um, I'd, I've always enjoyed applied logic um, and I've always enjoyed anything that's creative um, uh, and making things. Um, and the nice, the nice thing about software especially is that you really are able to create whole worlds and universes for yourself um, and it's, it's a fast paced area um, with, a lot of, with a lot of creativity involved so I, th I think that's what I like. The other thing I really like about it and I think uh, maybe more so in this area than, than other industries is it's tremendously meritocratic. Um, it's a it's an industry where ideas have the, the value and you know you can rock up in a Superman t-shirt or a pair of, pair of Bermuda shorts or a suit and, and everyone's equal. Uh, so that's, that's really what attracts me to it. Uh, I think it was uh, Grady Bush who used to be one of the principal IBM uh, gurus who said that uh, he saw a, a beauty to software programming. Would you agree with that statement? I think it depends very much on the software that's being programmed. Uh, I've seen some software that is not beautiful um, and some software that's very elegant. Uh, it's, a, it's a language, so it's a bit like saying a book is, is beautiful. Uh, some books are, some, some of us are. So can you tell us a little bit about some of your company and what it does? Sure, yeah. Um, so we we create applications that specialize in, in security and compliance. Um, and those applications act on voice, uh, so predominantly telephone calls. Uh, and then we sell these applications through some of the world's biggest telcos. So, uh, I mean, <clears throat> is there a, a legal precedent for some of what you do? So, I mean, d is it sort of mandatory uh, for, for companies to do, do the sort of things you do? Yeah, very much so. So, some of the applications that we produce help companies with uh, PCI compliance, which is the payment card industry's data security standards, which is something that's been coming in quite strongly over the last few years. and helps companies to protect the data that they hold uh, on their customers uh, and mitigates some of the risk that, that, that pertains to holding that data. Um, and there are other, other pieces of legislation and compliance that, that we help with some of our other products, so uh, FCA compliance, uh, Dodd-Franks, um, really the whole area has is, is been expanding considerably over the last, last many years. Um, uh, as people take take data security more seriously 
and the risks uh, have been going up too with the amount of data that's stored and movement to 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 IT services. Because uh, you know IT security is now one of the uh, things that are on the, the the sort of list of nightmares for most CEO CIOs at the moment. Um, do we do you think we're getting there now with um, you know the whole cloud security? Um, Issue of mobile security. Where are we? Do you think we are we keeping up with the bad guys? Or well, I think there's been a lot of positive movement. Um, I think that there's an awareness that it hasn't been there before, and it is something that that gets discussed at board level in in whatever size company you go and speak to, um, and that of course is a function of the severity of, of the risk. Um, so there have been notable breaches, if you think uh, about Target and, and others, um, there are very significant risks that, that companies take on when they hold data on behalf of their customers. So the, certainly the, the, the area is, is taken more seriously now and as a consequence there's a lot more effort and work that's put into securing services, um, but equally you could argue that the threat is bigger too, um, as hackers, you know, kind of uh, um, get more intelligent uh, uh, ways of hacking, and you know, and, and, and the risk the risk factors go up. Of course, uh, one of the biggest risk factors are, are people in the system, aren't they? So, uh, um, so. Kind of going back to your uh, your kind of your, your organisation. Uh, obviously, something that's kind of key to it is hybrid cloud. Mm -hmm. Can can you explain a little bit about the evolution of hybrid cloud, where it's come from, where you think it's kind of going to? Yeah, absolutely. And I try and avoid <coughs> kind of buzzwords in this. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, really, what this means is, it, if we think about the term cloud now, and as it's used widely. Um, people m mostly refer to the public cloud offerings, so that would be Azure and EC2. Um, where we say a private cloud, we're talking about infrastructure that's hosted that we are in control of. Um, and the way we use the cloud and the public cloud is that we run our own infrastructure, and that's quite important for us for a number of reasons. Um, our business is, is firmly anchored in security and compliance and it's very important to us that we've got the maximum amount of control over our infrastructure and systems so that we can demonstrate firstly to ourselves and, and secondly to our clients that we have a good handle on the security. Um, and it, it also bleeds into other regulations such as data residency um, laws uh, that that may be uh, applicable to a state, or they may be they may simply be applicable to an individual client. Where is my data? Um, but that said, th we do use the public cloud. Um, so an example would be where we're stress testing our systems. We can roll out. Uh, a huge array of, of test systems in the cloud and, and have them log into our, into our actual system and start using it so that we can, we can stress test it and, and make sure that it behaves well under load. Um, the two, two sides of things that we tend to deal with is, is security and, and then uptime of our services. When you're selling through telcos you're, you're talking about a lot of nines uh, in terms of uptime. Um, and so a lot of the effort that, that gets put into the platform is around that area. Now, um, since you started the company, how, how would you say the technology has um, changed when it comes to things like PCI, DSS, and uh, you know, helping businesses transacting securely? Sure. Um, and I think this is interesting, going back to, to what you mentioned earlier, that, that people are one of the biggest risks often in any company when it comes to data. Um, so PCI started as a very pragmatic set of, of um, guidelines to help, uh, to help merchants protect data. Um, and in fact, it's, a, it's an excellent standard. Um, uh, more than others, it, it really does go down to some detail. Um, and the, 
the, the kind of um, uh, actions that it that it suggests that companies take uh, are very good for anyone, no matter what data you're holding. Um, it's grown considerably over time, um, and it's grown in terms of complexity over time, um, and it's evolved, and um, it really constitutes quite a large burden, especially to lar large organisations, um, to try and keep a handle on, on their data and on the security of their data. Um, so what we've seen in the last few years, certainly in our area of securing voice, is solutions that take away some of the heavy lifting of putting these controls around infrastructure. Um, and what that really means is trying to reduce the, the, the risk, the overall risk. And the easiest way of doing that is effectively not to store the data in the first place where you have to. Um, if the bad guys come and break into your systems, the best possible outcome would be that there's nothing there for them to steal. So the technology that we've been working on specifically protects credit card information from entering organizations. Um, and instead of customers reading out credit card details over the phone, they're asked to type those details into their telephone keypad. Um, and then we're integrated right up with the telco layer um, and trap these, these tones as they're typed in by the customers before they enter the, the merchant's enterprise. And in that way, we prevent credit card data from entering the merchant in the first place. And so that's where we reduce the risk. Um, and that's, that's one really good example, I think, of, of where some creative thinking and some innovation has come in and, and reduced the overall risk for everyone. So that's reduced the risk for the consumers and the merchants and the card brands as well. And, I mean, do you think we've, we've uh, in your area, um, there's, there's the right level of governance, the right level of legislation, or do you think it needs more? I think it will always get more. Um, it's an arms race, ultimately. So as you, as, you protect, as you protect data more, you protect systems more, then the threats get more sophisticated also. Um, I think a broad brush approach of, of legislation is, is absolutely required, um, but equally it needs to be good legislation and it needs to be practical legislation. Um, I think compliance regs for compliance regs sake are a waste of time. Um, but if they demonstrably reduce the overall risk, then that's great, and that's great for everyone. Um, now, there's, there's quite a lot of myths um, surrounding PCI DSS, um, such as if your business is uh, non-PCI compliant, will the card brands fine you? Mm -hmm. uh, or if an auditor is satisfied you are PCI compliant, does that mean you're officially PCI certified? Um, uh, what, what's the what's the situation on those? What do what do companies really need to know? Yeah, yeah sure. I, uh, well, I think first and foremost, um, we can dispel the myth that a merchant or a company themselves will get fined directly from one of the card brands um, because they don't have a relationship directly with one of the card brands. They have a relationship with their acquiring bank, um, and there may be contractual obligations with the acquiring bank. Um, such that penalties are, uh, are enforced um, in the case of a breach or, or in the case of not being PCI compliant. Um, but really, those reasons are not the reasons why companies should invest in protecting their, their data. Um, and, and they're not really the reasons that we're seeing companies are investing and taking this seriously. It's the risk to their business that's the serious point. And going back to the previous example, you only need to look at Target and others to see what happens to companies when they're lax on security um, uh, and to see what effect that has all the way up to the very top of the company, both in terms of money, heads on the line, 
um, and uh, and ultimately affecting the customers. So what would you say are the, the biggest challenges for organisations like yourself going forward? So there's an education piece um, which is which is historically been a bit of a challenge and there has been misinformation out there in the marketplace um, particularly in voice there's been um, information put out that simply pausing call recordings for example while credit card information is read out over the phone automatically makes you PCR compliant um, which is a myth uh, you still have that credit card information flowing through your systems you still have agents on the other end of the phone that are able to listen to those credit card details and um, really all that's protecting is call recordings that you know admittedly would have the, the credit card information on otherwise so it is a protection in, in that sense um, but it's not complete with tech protection and it certainly doesn't automatically give you PCR compliance um, so there's an education piece um, and I think um, there's, there's an element that the market is still waking up to, to the risks involved, um, although we really are seeing a lot of movement there, especially in, especially in the larger organisations. I mean, <coughs> go back to the sort of cloud in general and the evolution mm -hmm. of cloud, where do you think, which direction are we heading in next sort of thing? Well, uh, I think in, in the lifetime of our company, we've seen a huge move to centralized hosted data sources and that's completely understandable um, just thinking about some of the systems that we've integrated or interacted with over these years that don't follow that model that follow perhaps a slightly more uh, legacy type model with with disparate data sources and um, uh, multiple account logins and access it's incredible the complexity that that grows up over that and it's incredible that the the attack vectors and the, the risk associated with with that kind of environment as well so there are many reasons why you would centralize data um, and there are many reasons why you would um, expose that via the internet and, and via this this wonderful technology um, so with that, we've seen a huge rise in the number of software as a service companies offering um, enterprise solutions and, uh, and other products that, that people have been, been taking up. And over time, we've seen um, kind of a, a more relaxed stance taken by some of the larger organizations um, when they consider using a, a software as a service versus maybe an in-house solution or uh, a CPE, a customer premises uh, solution to, to, to their problems. So we very much see that trend continuing. Um, we think it's inevitable. Um, but we also think there's a, a big advantage of outsourcing um, specialist subjects to specialists. If you're a uh, retailer, then your business is, is not protecting risk, it's, it's not building uh, custom service systems or um, you know, billing systems or accountancy systems or any other kinds of systems. Your, your business is retail and um, you're going to do best where you can concentrate on, on doing that job. Uh, and so where there are specialist companies who spend all of their time thinking about security or thinking about these other problems, then it makes a lot of sense to outsource to the experts and, and get the benefits of, of their expertise in, in the subject.